Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year uh, from all of us at DAT. Um, this is our first show of 2024. Uh, we're thrilled to make it to the other side of the new year. We're thrilled to have uh, rail economist extraordinaire Jim Blaze on with us this morning. Uh, dean Croak, um, as always, new year, same dean, which we're very lucky to have um, joining us for another year here at DAT. And unfortunately, you're stuck with me, uh, Ken Adamo, uh, Chief of Analytics over here at DAT. I'm hoping all of those folks up north are enjoying the national title between now and when the NCAA officially vacates it, probably over the summer, um, for the fact that they indeed cheated um, to get said national title. I'd expect nothing less of the University of Michigan being the fine institution um, that it is, um, when by any means necessary. So... <laughs> Uh, they'll go back from having one and a half national titles in the last 50 years to having just one half. So that's my commentary. I didn't watch a play of the game last night. I, I don't watch the Astros. I don't listen to Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire. And I certainly don't um, watch Michigan football, given that they're cheaters. Okay. So we're here to talk about freight. Um, I'll be making a bit of a departure here uh, towards the 20 minute mark after the hour. Um, they've got a Mount Rushmore plus Ken show happening with Samantha Jones. We've got Chris Pickett, Jason Miller, uh, Rob Haddock from Coke. Uh, so we'll be talking about stuff there. Um, before we dig into it, Jim, you want to give a quick intro? Yeah, I'm uh, glad to be back with uh, you folks and uh, share my uh, views on railroad upside, downside, and how to overcome. So thank you for inviting me. Dean speaks very highly of you, so I'm really interested, even though I might not be able to participate live in the rail discussion. Um, spoiler alert for our question of the week. I am excited to listen to it uh, recorded. So let's get into our questions of the week without further, I'm sorry, our key trends of the week without further ado. A little rusty. Um, the year ended pretty much exactly as expected. Um, I had a little straw poll on social media. Um, myself and a lot of others guessed about a buck 75 is where we'd end on day 365. Um, we had 366 days this year for those leap year enthusiasts um, that are out there, um, but pretty much exactly in line with 2019. Um, average contract rates are up about a percentage point, but replacement rates are down 8%. You might notice that's a departure from the double digit uh, downward replacement rates. Uh, that is another sign that the market is bottoming. Uh, that will eventually go to zero and then um, start ticking back up probably in the next couple of quarters, I would expect. Long haul capacity continues to exit with a net loss of 29,000 carriers in 2023. I suspect we're probably already over um, 30,000 just with some of the early attrits. A lot of folks um, aren't going to pay to retitle their truck that might be on annual titling and things like that. Manufacturing continues to contract, but at a slightly slower um, PMI rate. So remember, that's a diffusionary index. When it's above 50, it's expanding. When it's below 50, it's contracting. Uh, and lastly, December imports up 4% month over month and 5% higher. Uh, continuing to watch um, developments in the Red Sea um, as the Houthis continue to snarl ocean traffic for the major shipping lines through the Suez Corridor. So with that, turn it over to Dean from First Market Update of the Year. Dean? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, great to be back with everybody. A um, little bit hard to make a lot of sense out of our week-over-week week comps because of the disruption in the market uh, over the break between Christmas and New Year. But um, let's start off with uh, where spot market load posts are. They're about half what they were a year ago, uh, just looking at year-over-year year comps. Um, and compared to all of the years, you know, pre-pandemic years, uh, about 19% below the long-term average for uh, the first week of the shipping year. Uh, a lot more carriers taking time off. Could be a combination of, uh, you know, more vacation time and carrier exits, though. That makes sense after 15 months of uh, a net loss in the long-haul capacity. Um, so uh, equipment posts are down compared to prior years. Load-to-truck ratio sitting at about 3.37. In refrigerated, uh, load posts compared to this time last year are about 60% lower. Produce volumes, according to the USDA, are about 13% lower last week across the 19 growing regions. Load-to-truck ratio and reef are, are sitting at about 5.40. It's about half what it was this time last year. And in flatbed, uh, load posts started 2024, much the same as where they ended, at about 50% lower than this time last year. Load-to-truck ratio just under 10 at 9.48 loads per truck. 
Uh, having a couple of the markets on our market condition index, our top five markets uh, for spot market freight, Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, Elizabeth, and Los Angeles. Rates were up just a penny per mile last week. Average is about $1.70, slightly lower than the national average. Uh, Texas was the big mover last week. Outbound rates up five cents a mile to 207. That's the outbound state average. Remember, folks, these are line haul rates excluding fuel. Uh, one of the busy lanes out of um, Texas uh, in D Dallas, Dallas Fort Worth area, line haul rates there uh, averaged uh, up about five cents a mile. They were paying carries about $1.57. Volumes were a little bit higher last week. Um, the other key market we watch is uh, Atlanta, big distribution freight market in the southeast. Rates are up a cent per mile to $1.65. And on the number one spot market lane for carriers out of Atlanta to Lakeland, which includes Orlando, rates averaged 245 last week. It's a lot higher than the national average out of the uh, market because of the uh, return lane is much lower. So carriers need a higher southbound rate to balance it. Having a look at refrigerated, um, obviously a very strong market up in the Pacific Northwest still. Four produce volumes are still fairly significant there. Outbound rates in Oregon at 214 a mile. They're the highest in nine years in that state. Uh, that's excluding 2021 and 2022. Um, Pendleton market, the big market there uh, where we see a lot of produce come out. Rates were up 10 cents a mile, averaging $2.15 per mile last week. Um, the USDA reported a slight shortage of trucks to haul onions and potatoes last week in that region. Uh, carriers were paid on average $1.85 a mile to move loads from Pendleton to Los Angeles, almost the same as what it was last year. And we're starting to see a lot more volume come across the southern border. Uh, this is the start of their produce shipping season, which peaks in May for Mexican imports. Um, about 60% of the produce is going to come across through McAllen. Um, in that South Texas market, uh, capacity tightened there for the fourth week in a row, rates up 22 cents a mile last week, averaging $2.50 for outbound loads. Um, the USDA also reported a slight shortage of trucks in the Galas and Caliexo border crossings. A lot of imported uh, produce comes across there that goes to the West Coast. Reefer rates in these locations, I expect to climb in the lead up to this year's Super Bowl in Las Vegas, particularly for tomatoes and avocados for obvious reasons. Uh, in flatbed, uh, outbound rates in Texas, one of our biggest spot market states, uh, up for the fourth week, average $2.02 .02 per mile. Uh, for context, that puts the state average rates around 10 cents a mile higher than where they were in 2018. Uh, flatbed carriers in Alabama starting the year on a high. Leverage loads for outbound loads in Alabama, $2.26. That's the highest since last October. And wrapping up our market update with our year-over-year -year look at rates, at $1.75 a mile, uh, as Ken mentioned, they're pretty much exactly where we forecast they'd be. Um, spot rates are sitting at about $0.23 cents a mile lower than last year and about $0.05 cents a mile higher than the start of 2020 as the market continued to shed capacity. Uh, on our top 50 lanes, based on the volume of loads moved, they averaged $2.05 per mile uh, last week. They've been maintaining that $0.30 cent per mile spread between that uh, top 50 lane average and the national average for about two months now. In refrigerated, uh, line haul rates ended last year at $2.18 a mile. It was a late surge uh, in the week before Christmas. Rates jumped $0.19 cents a mile. Since then, rates have lost about half of that gain, ending last week at $2.11. It's about 26 cents a mile lower than this time last year. And lastly, in flatbed, after ending last year at uh, just under $2 a mile, uh, flatbed rates have decreased by two cents a mile last week. They're averaging $1.97 a mile last week, about 23 cents a mile lower than this time last year. So that's it for this week's market update, the first of the year. If you want to find out more about what's happening in freight, you can go to dat.com forward slash market update and download our weekly report, which will be published later this evening. So we're over to Ken now for the short-term forecast. All right. Thank you, Dean. Uh, so we talked quite a bit heading up to the holiday that the forecasts were not particularly useful because they were only going to show an up and to the right trend, I would tell you the same thing, but in reverse this time of year. Um, typically, we'd be seeing rates already crashing, to be quite honest, but return season with the e-commerce shift that happened about a decade ago um, has prolonged the holiday uh, seasonal pressure a bit into you know maybe the second-ish week of December. I'm sorry, January. Um, so 
what you can see here, we always start with dry van. The blue line is the historical average. You can see that run up. As we talked about, the forecasts were in alignment, and it's a good thing they were because they sh the rates shot up to about a buck seventy-five. Overshot that a little bit into the new year, and now uh, we have four forecast models. Uh, really, I don't even need to bother explaining to you because they're all going to show the exact same thing, which is a pullback. I do think the one caution I'll give is these models don't essentially sense bottom here, right? All they sense is like an extreme contraction back due to seasonal. Um, in short-term pressures. So um, do I think rates will snap back to $1.55 or $1.50 a mile? Probably not. In the next couple of weeks, as we continue to show these forecasts, um, they will, in different um, time frames, each of these four lines, which are different forecast models, will start um, to sense where bottom is going to be and, and form, for lack of a better term, an opinion on it. It's not really an opinion because it's a computer um, and computers haven't yet found out how to think for themselves. Uh, but if they could, we'd call it an opinion. Um, here we might call it a scenario. Um, so that's dry van. Reefer is going to be the exact same thing. You've got the uh, the yellow blended forecast just kind of hanging out in orbit over there. It, maybe it, it had too much eggnog with uh, brandy in it, and it's just swimming in um, the holiday high that was a couple weeks ago. But all the other forecasts are pretty much aligned, which where things are going to go. Um, and then just to be stubborn and contradictory, uh, this is the flatbed forecast last this isn't really a time of the year that's impacted. So flatbed doesn't get as overbought. And when I say overbought, I mean rates go up a lot higher than they were before. So therefore, it doesn't get as oversold, which means rates come back down. Um, it's just sort of middling about. Um, a lot of uh, big economic factors. I had a great uh, session with a heavy haul specialized hauler last week. Um, if we can see some increased consumer uh, residential construction and interest rates drop, I think. Uh, could be a, a decent year for flatbed this year. So with that, um, we got to the question of the week, Dean. Okay, we got to pull long terms real quick. I just make a mental note. We pulled them. Um, it's really not a good idea to pull them during Christmas because the forecast models are in the festive spirit and don't give us the best uh, outlook. So maybe this week or next week, Dean, I'll refresh them and we'll pull them on the show. Okay. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds good. I'll remind right. you a bit later. Let's Thanks, get into Eric. it. All right. Thanks, Ken. So, Jim, uh, welcome back. Um, one of the topics you and I have talked about a lot over the years um, is about Class 1 railroads, short short line railroads, and this this um, always uh, sort of uh, the topic sort of raises its head every now and then about whether the Class 1 railroads can take away market share from trucking, uh, in particular in short haul, right? I mean, the, it's clear that railroads own the long distance sector, like Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, Kansas City, Dallas. But on the short haul sector, where obviously the majority of freight moves, what's your take on whether Class One railroads can, you know, make a serious move and and compete with truckload on short line, short distances? Well, interesting that I did uh, teamed with some other folks, uh, Randy Reeser. Uh, and uh, Professor Morlock from UPenn 20 to 30 years ago, and we wrote a paper that's still out on the internet, says short haul intermodal. Can you make it work? And yes, you can. But right. you basically have to subdivide intermodal into its various components, who's doing what, the terminal operations, the drayage, and the line haul. Now, the railroads are really good at the line haul, but they're not really good at uh, basically running terminals or doing the drayage. So... Uh, and then, uh, then the, there's the government that basically says, well, this is great for our citizens, so we really need you to you step up to the plate and do this. And, well, by the way, while you're doing it, we're saving a lot of money on highway maintenance because those trucks aren't doing damage to our roads. Great. Right. There's a formula right there that they telegraph to everybody that says, well, well here's the solution. Take half the money that uh, you're saving on your maintenance and put it into helping us build the model for this intermodal operation. The execution of the model is gonna require drayage terminals that basically, and, and terminals like that uh, to a railroad, class one railroad are sinkholes of costs. It's not a profit center. The profit center is the hook and haul on the, long, on the longer distance. So whether that's 40 miles or 200 miles or thousand miles, that's where they make their money. And so the, the nature of the deal is you put together a complex uh, multi-party deal where basically various parties sign up in a, on a particular quarter. And I'll just take Bakersfield, uh, California, where I happen to know there's a, a good site for an intermodal terminal. And, and you run uh, short-haul intermodals to the port in the metro complex of, uh, 
uh, Oakland and also the other opposite direction down to LA and Long Beach. And uh, basically the railroad's responsible for the hook and haul and the transportation and drainage. And would it have to add some capacity on over the Hatchapi Mountains? Yeah, but that, that's not a big deal. We're not talking like spending $20 billion to do that. We're talking about spending, I don't know, a couple of hundred million, maybe maybe 400 million. And right. so that project basically had, would have a return on, re, uh, on investment and cover its operating costs. So, and uh, in the terminal operations, the complex, the uh, uh, pavement and the control dispatching in and out of the drainage operation for the terminal to load the trains, that's all going to be handled by and financed as an infrastructure uh, by government assistance rather than private enterprise from the class one railroads. They're not going to write a check for that because they don't know how to make money on that part. So the nature of the deal is you got to figure out how to do a deal with the chief financial officer of the class one railroad involved because the chief financial officer has to bless he or she that, yep, this is good for our shareholders and we can make prof a profit on our side of the operation. And then you put together a complex uh, uh, multi-party uh, legal agreement that's in operating terms with you know financial structure to it and says, well, here's how everybody's going to pay their fair share and cover their cost of the operation. So I, I see a three or four party uh, agreement that basically would allow that to be executed. Voila. Right. Sounds now who's going to do that? Right. It's pretty easy. Why don't we just do it? I mean, it's... I don't I don't know any class one railroad executive so far that stepped up to the plate and said, yeah, let's do that. I'll get together with the DOT at the Fed and state level. And and then we'll get the, these other drainage parties and we'll put a team together and it'll be an investment group. Yeah. Right. OK, let's get going. Listen, I'm available. I still haven't kicked the can yet. So if, if you need any help. You know, I'll just discount my rates. Right. <laughs> Jim, uh, is there a particular uh, length of haul where this might be viable or not become viable? Well, you know, it's uh, what, 45 kilometers or miles, I forget which, the Panama Canal, that, that they, you know, they operate, the Kansas City Southern Subsidy has operated that train, short haul shuttle train up. Uh, and I've actually seen it in operation down there for a um, better part of a decade, I believe. So, yeah, you, you know, I mean, you now in theory, you can make this work. What you need is a, s a specific size of density, and then the railroad needs to know, okay, well, do I have to adjust somehow? Uh, do I have to put some passing sightings in on the main line? Do I have to right. have special crews? Might I be better off if I had pooled equipment signed only for this operation so that? Equipment never goes away and gets gets uh, sent off to North Carolina, North Dakota, or wherever, and it's not available when I need it. So I think that's the nature of the structure. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so I don't want to say no. There's a limit. Right. When I when we look at um, Ari Ash's journal, uh, the JSC Journal of Commerce Intermodal Index data, it would seem that once you get over about seventeen hundred miles, intermodal owns the majority of those lanes. But there are some lanes that seem to favour truckload more so than any. I think there's probably about a dozen that he has in his index each month where uh, truckloads tends to be more competitive on a rate per mile perspective. But 1700s, you know, that's quite long haul. There must be a range in there. And is it so is it mileage? Is it mileage based or is it time based where intermodal could be, you know, competitive? Like, is it an overnight transit where uh, intermodal could be competitive against trucking on a shorter length of haul? You know, there have been various experiments like uh, Denver to Salt Lake and Chicago to St. Louis that have been uh, tried by some of the uh, uh, lines, and they weren't successful at it. There's no real diagnosis as to why they weren't successful. But, you know, guys like uh, Gunn and... Uh, uh, David Burns, uh, there are people basically who are associated directly with that, that as a team are available to bring in and consult and say, okay, why this fail? Hmm. And I, I, you know, I may have two lenses as an economist and a, and a uh, engineer that I could add to that discussion, but I don't myself have enough I information to give you the answer you're looking for. Right, right. Uh, but a lot of this was also done when they were hauling trailer and flat cars. Trailer on flight car economics are not very good. They're no, nowhere near as good as the double stack. So maybe we were all using the wrong equipment and it was the wrong time. Right. And there could have been physical reasons or bottleneck reasons or, or crew uh, shortage reasons. So, so I don't, I don't want to say that I know the answer. 
Mm. There is an answer there. And, and hey, listen, the verbal history, the oral history of people who are associated with it is there to collect now if you hurry. Right. <laughs> right. So, Jim, one of the one of the things that popped up this week, uh, the Journal of Commerce were talking about the Alameda Corridor and that whole, um, you know, the transloading piece of uh, international imports that come into Los Angeles, they get shipped out to the um, Inland Empire, and then there's a sort of a massive transloading operation that undertakes uh, that's undertaken. But a lot of that freight volume, um, I, on a webinar before Christmas, the head of the Port of Long Beach said about two thirds of all imports end up east of the Mississippi. And uh, and I thought it was a really interesting data point. But so for those that you know, sort of not familiar with intermodal and railroads in general. Can you sort of speak to the economics of, you know, uh, double stack rail cars moving freight off the West Coast to a lot further than halfway across the country, as opposed to coming to the East Coast to say Savannah with imports? I'm going to go back to some of the original numbers where I saw the numbers because I was still working at Conroe and I had up front. So we're going back 25 years or 30 years when APL first started with double stack. And what we saw internally at Conroe from our side of the moves on an interline move that came across at Chicago or St. Louis and moved on east was, uh, look, um, our cost structure for hauling a trailer on a flight car was, I don't know, say, say, say I'm going to I'm going to use uh, target numbers that were not exactly correct, but you'll get an order of magnitude. Let's just say it was what, 45 cents a car mile to, to move it at that time. A trailer, a, a, a 40 to a 45 foot trailer, because they didn't have fits and threes back then. Um, if, if I could double stack, the railroad's cost dropped to somewhere like uh, 25 cents. There was, there was roughly a 35% to 45% efficiency per mile once I had it on the train and it was moving. Now, as long as I didn't stop and do any work in, in route at a terminal, I just had my, you know, dispatching and train movement costs. I didn't have any more terminal costs until I got to the end. And at that time, APL was doing the terminal loading of the train and the terminal unloading. And in fact, APL actually owned the, uh, the uh, containers and did all the sales coverage. So the railroad had no real tail, retail costs. We're talking about a wholesale operation. Now, that's pretty much still true today. That if I go in and structurally look, I, you know, I'd have to get some access to some more relevant uh, modern costs. But if you went went in, I would say uh, roughly it's 35 percent more efficient today than than hauling a trailer on a flat car. And that's why Larry Gross is right when he says, you know, the trailer on flat car business is kind of going away. Mm. Uh, so it's a double stack operation. Uh, people say, well, we'd be better off with a road railway. Yeah, the road railway has some other mechanical engineering issues, which, uh, very, so let's not get into that comparison. I'm just saying, look, if, if, you, if I told you right today that the cost for being in Santa Fe and Norfolk Southern to do a joint haul from Port of LA to Atlanta or to um, the New York area was somewhere in the, their cost was 90 cents per mile. Once it's on, once it's on the train. Well, what trucking company do you know of that can move a truck across the road for ninety cents a mile and cover its cost? Yeah, not none that I know of. None. Yeah. All right. So now, so then we get into the pricing leverage. Okay. Well, what's the railroad? Well, if the railroad wants to make a you know a return a, a margin of let's say forty percent, right, which is the converse of the sixty percent operating ratio. And it basically wants a return on investment for uh, 18%. Well, you know, can you do some back of the envelope calculations? You can say, well, the railroad's going to charge somebody like its best customer, which would be uh, the, the fellow with the, the white and the yellow boxes, Hunt and, and a few others. They're going to charge them what? Well, if it's a double stack move, they're going to charge them basically, I'm going to say $1.25 to $1.30 a mile. Well, how many truckers are, can make money at that on a head hold or a direction that that kind of not not from any of the rates you were quoting earlier in this session? Yeah. Well, so, not... so the railroads have this leverage in these lanes that are high density and long distances. Right. I don't have interruptions of other other bottlenecks or terminal costs. Got it. 
And and as long as they can make returns that are at least 35 percent and maybe a 15 percent return on investment, then the railroad ought to be interested in that because that's their growth. It's interesting. I was just looking at on rate view what the rates are today, Jim, for Los Angeles, Atlanta, for example, sitting at about two dollars and seven per mile. So that's about a 70 percent premium to your example uh, for long. Is that a spot rate? No, it's con that was contract rate, Jim. Oh, that's a contract rate for, for trucking. Yep. Okay. Well, I'm I'm, I'm going to. I don't know what the actual contract rate be in uh, be in Santa Fe would charge for a move, let's say, to Atlanta over, over its trackage rights on CSX east of the Mississippi in that lane. But I'm going to dare say it isn't anywhere near two bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, um, one of the more fascinating questions that you've been able to help answer for me <clears throat> over the years is uh, and we talked a bit this on sales chatter a few months ago but why chicago why does so much intermodal freight from the west coast that comes on the trans-pacific trade lane from asia why does it end up in chicago and then gets you know rubber tied across town before it connects to east coast railroads to end up say here in boston where i live yeah the simplest answer i can recall for our, our listeners today is look uh, throughout the the period of uh, railroad expansion which was right after the civil war uh through uh, world war ii and into the manuf manufacturing output following world war world war ii that maybe started to end or ebb around the 1980s when that was no longer a manufacturing belt those areas of chicago and upper ohio etc were the manufacturing belt of the u.s i mean that's what helped win world war ii right all that manufacturing capacity and uh, so you built the infrastructure and the main routes and the double stack and the triple stack routes uh, line routes came in through that area. So that infrastructure is there and it's not easy to take up and remove and replace that infrastructure for a railroad movement pass to some other gateway. Right. So none of the other gateways like Memphis or Meridian or uh, New Orleans ever had that kind of infrastructure in place. And nobody's been investing in, in that kind of railroad infrastructure over the years. So it's natural that we have this lag with mm -hmm. nope, uh, that's that's where the pattern was, and we're going to stick where. Now uh, there have been various attempts to bypass Chicago by you know going through Effingham or some of the uh, cities to the north, and uh, they they didn't pan out to be to be a lasting thing. So I'm I think we're stuck with that route basic route configuration that focuses in the upper upper Midwest area around Chicago. We're probably going to be stuck with that, and we ought to play that as a as a good card, mm -hmm. and then we ought to look at Atlanta. And a couple other gateways like maybe Memphis uh, or St. Louis, when the time is right, and and when we're sure that in fact we can capture more uh, intermodal market share by changing and improving those lanes. Mm -hmm. I don't see that happening in the next two years. Mm -hmm. That's probably a ten or fifteen year migration. Mm -hmm. So, Jim, just on the topic of Chicago, um, I, I never knew this, but until you told me that a lot of that freight that comes into Chicago has to get transported by truck. And we've got a lot of drage customers and it's a massive drage market, that whole Chicago Joliet market. So could just sort of talk about the logistics of why can't they connect the railroads on the inbound side from the West Coast to the outbound East Coast side? Well, one of the reasons is there's this demand for commuter service and Amtrak service to use these lines, which is why we got this billion and a half dollar or $2 billion Chicago create project. And the engineering and the build out of that has been taking like 30 years. And in fact, I was at the Chicago Area Transportation Study making forecasts. We had to be doing that. And the year was 1972. We, we didn't get around to even starting until about, what, 20, 2010. So our right. society is a little slow at executing right. right. grand concepts that are laid out early. Right. We just are. Right. So uh, there's that demand. And uh, the, these trains are also moving against, uh, there's still a lot of pickup and delivery, local manufacturer switching train operations. Well, they kind of clog the network. You're going through the most clogged part of the arterial and, and, uh, and vein system uh, in a heavy urbanized area. Now, you want to go around. You want to go around on the Indiana Harbor Belt or the BNOCT or the new Canadian National Route, or, or you want to have the terminals built outside. I think, for example, personally, as a Chicago urbanist, I think uh, when Norfolk Southern decided to re rebuild their uh, and expand their intermodal operation down near the uh, Dan Ryan Expressway at 63rd Street, that was the worst place to put it from the point of view of 
well, I, I got to use the highway network. So where are the highway network key connections that are important to drainage? Uh, th they're essentially Interstate 80 from uh, Joliet or where I-55 comes, comes, comes down and serves that complex of the Joliet Arsenal area, where we got UP and B and Santa Fe terminals, and east to the uh, Indiana border and I-55. And uh, we should have been building highway capacity along there to expand and put in maybe some truck lanes in order to encourage the drainage if we were thinking multimodal. Right. Now, I actually worked for the Illinois Department of Transportation when I first started back in the 1960s and 1970s, and we recommended that. Did they do that? Right. No. <laughs> no. They're, still, they're, they're building the bridges across an I-80 now, right, trying to fill in that gap. Right. Uh, and, and well, we could have, should have started that 20 years ago or 30 years ago, we, right. but we did it. Right. So there's a failure to communicate. Uh, between all the parties in the railroad, class one railroads aren't in charge of a lot of this. Mm -hmm. These decisions have to be made by other PPP partners, right? Right. right. We haven't figured out how to do that yet. We we need to we need to speed that up. Yeah, it's it's interesting these discussions. I mean, because trucking's very agile, nimble, can sort of turn on a dime literally. Um, at the other end of the scale, we've got you know railroads that are, uh, but form an essential part of our shipper networks. Um, you know, freight movement, Jim. It's a, it's a big part of DAT's business, the shipper side of our business, and they move a substantial amount of freight volume on intermodal as much as they do on our truck. Sure. No, I understand. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's important to, to have this perspective. I've always, um, you know, been very careful to watch intermodal rates. I think they're a very good indicator of where shippers are moving high volumes of freight in particular. Yes, but I'm going to say that of all the freight that needs to move by priority, I'm going, to, I'm going to say half of it, round numbers. This is from, from my, my strategic point of view as a railroad guy looking back. Only about half of it chooses intermodal as it's, you know, yeah, this is the priority we should be going at. The other half is still stricken with uh, primary trucking mm -hmm. and premium trucking services. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the social cost of associated with that hasn't been priced in yet. It probably will be over the next 10 or 15 years but not, not during 2024, right. uh, not even during 2025. That's a longer thing. So right. moving that so that the decision in the buying, buying assessment by the people who are the receivers, not the shippers, the receivers, to say, well, um, are you going to be part of the, you know, the environmental game? And are, if so, then intermodal has got to be a bigger play. Are you willing to do that? Uh, mm -hmm. Because you're going to take a day and a half delay on a, you know, six day move, but you know, are you ready? Right. Uh, are they? Right. Do right. they have the, do they have the analytical tools to make that kind of calculation and say, man, okay, here's the direct cost, the indirect cost. And the, if I had put in the indirect cost, then the intermodal makes better sense. I should be doing this. I think, I, I think a lot of companies that don't have those skills. I think they need to, need to hire Jim Blaze. <laughs> well, they better hurry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have enough energy to work for everybody. I'm a little short of breath. <laughs> uh, we love having you on, Jim. You're one of the best. Um, but that look, that brings us sort of to the end of our show. We're, we're running up on time here. We could chat all day about this. Um, a uh, couple of shout outs, Jim, before I, I bring you back. Um, next week's show, uh, we've got. Uh, Chuck Snow um, from Canada talking about the Canadian update um, with the freight market up there. Um, tomorrow I'm on uh, sales chatter with Dan Deegan. Robert Rouse is on Landline Now on Sirius XM on Wednesday evening. Very interesting discussion coming up on Freightvine podcast. Professor Kaplis is talking to Erez Ag Agmoni. He's the global head of innovation at Maersk Shipping, the number two shipping company in the world. And, um, and Jim, just for those that don't know you or how to get in contact with you, if someone had questions or wanted to engage your services, how would they get in contact with you? Uh, just, uh, I have a link, you know, you can reach out on to me on LinkedIn, or you basically can reach out and on uh, by just sending me a Jim Dash Blaze, uh, spelled B L A Z E, at Comcast.net. Um, or, Reach out to somebody else you probably know who already knows me and say, "Hey, got places email." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or give me a call. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy always to talk. I'm always excited to share a little bit of my knowledge uh, with people who want to chat because every time somebody calls me with a problem, I learn something. Yeah, I yeah. love to keep learning. You are you're one of the best, Jim. I've learned so much by talking to you over the years. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity Thank to uh, work with you both at Freightways and here. Um, 
so yeah, that's uh, that's the end of our show, folks. Um, I'll be coming to you from down under next week in Australia. I'm off tomorrow, so um, look forward to talking to you. We'll be able to bring some perspective on trucking from another country. And um, with that, it's the end of our show, first show of the year. Jim, thanks for having us. Uh, thank us thank you so much, Dean and gentlemen. I appreciate it so much. All right. Okay. That's the uh, end of our show.